For the last eight years, I've been teaching climate change to people here in Ireland. And this week is a really big week for people like me who are interested in climate change, because right now, in Paris, the United Nations is meeting for the 21st year in a row to try and get a global agreement on climate. So I thought it might be a good time to look at how much has our interest in climate change varied over the years that I've been working on this issue. And of course, I went to Google, and I asked Google, since 2006, when Google started reporting this kind of data, how much have Irish people searched on the words climate change and global warming? And here's what I learned. Our interest in climate change peaked in 2007, and it's generally declined ever since. Now, there are lots of reasons for that. Some people blame the climate denial industry. Some people say it's the media's fault. Some people even say that we just haven't been communicating the science effectively. But in my experience, I think maybe you see these words, climate change, and you feel like you're about to watch some apocalyptic horror movie. I feel that way every time I read another article about yet another impact of climate change. And they are endless. Every day I hear that something is affected by climate change. But I think a big part of the problem, and why we haven't been as interested in climate change as maybe we should be, is because all we hear is climate problems. And we rarely ever get to talk about climate solutions. And there is actually a solution to climate change. The United Nations says that we need to keep our Earth's average temperature below two degrees of warming from pre-industrial temperatures. Last month, we hit the one degree mark. In order to do this, we have to only burn 20% of our known fossil fuel reserves, 20%. And we can't go looking for any more oil and gas because we won't be able to burn that either. That's the accepted solution to climate change. And for that reason, a lot of groups have started calling on governments and countries to become fossil free, to keep 80% of, of our fossil fuel reserves in the ground. Now, when I, by the way, in order to do this, to, to, re to stay under two degrees, we have to reach that by 2050, which is only 35 years from now, only a generation away. And when I heard that, I just thought that these groups were crazy. I mean, just think about all the things that we use fossil fuels for. Turning off those taps and keeping that fuel in the ground sounds impossible to me without really catastrophic changes to my quality of life. And I like my life. Maybe I don't want to change it. So I had to think about how would becoming fossil free actually affect my daily life. And right now, this is what consumes most of my daily life. Meet my very energetic five-year-old daughter, Eva. In 2050, 35 years from now, she'll be a little bit older than I am now. And I wonder, what will Eva's life be like as an adult woman potentially living in a fossil-free Ireland? And how does that compare to our lives today? So I started by looking at her home. Right now, this is what Eva's home is made of, the ubiquitous Irish concrete block. We've been making our homes out of this, gosh, I don't know, since for up until the last decade, strictly out of these concrete blocks. And there's nothing else that protects us from the Irish weather except for walls made of this. Look at the holes in that block, and you'll realize that in our home, when the heat is off and it's cold outside, it is freezing. And we're spending a fortune on gas to keep it warm. But now we know that there's a better way to do things. And so Irish companies like Kingspan Installation and Munster Joinery have actually become global leaders in making homes more energy efficient. So we don't need as much fuel to keep them warm. And the greatest engineering feat of the 20th century, electricity, is also the greatest technology to enable us to have fossil free heat and power. By 2050, Ireland's electricity grid could be 100% renewables based from wind, solar, and locally grown biomass. Now, Eva doesn't have to connect to that grid if she doesn't want to, because last month the ESB announced <laughs> that in the next 10 years, a third of our homes 
could already be powering all of their own electricity, already generating their electricity, and they could be selling the excess back to the grid and making money if they wanted to. But probably, you know, we think this is really hard and, and we, we can't do this. In reality, there are community groups already making the transition. Here's the Aran Islands Energy Cooperative. They decided that they wanted to become 100% fossil free, not because they cared about climate, but actually out of concern for their economy. And right now they're attracting the attention of businesses who are looking to move there to avail of cheaper, cleaner technology and cleaner energy. Clock Jordan Eco Village in Tipperary. 55 homes they've built are now near passive standard, which means those homes use 70% less energy than the house that Eva lives in. They've got another 120 planned, and the fuel that they use comes from locally grown wood chip, which means all the money they spend on fuel actually stays in their local economy rather than be given to big oil companies. I'd love for Eva to live in a passive home. Maybe she could retrofit our older, older home to passive standard, or maybe she'll live in a new passive apartment or house. But either way, her home is going to be quieter, brighter, healthier, and more efficient to run than the house she's living in today. Now, maybe when we think of fossil fuels, we don't necessarily think of our homes right away. We probably think of this, our cars, and the amount of time we sit in traffic. We're a car culture. And in fact, last week, 60% of businesses in Dublin said that they are losing money because the traffic has gotten so bad. We know that our transport system isn't working. But there's fossil-free transport out there that is working. And it's already happening all around Europe. Every car manufacturer in the world is working on electric vehicles right now. In Sweden, two-thirds of their buses are powered by ethanol from sugarcane, clean ethanol. In the UK, last year, they launched their first buses powered entirely by human and food waste. I'm not kidding, that is a real bus in Bristol, and the locals refer to it as the poo bus. <laughs> Back here at home, our Lewis system that runs on electricity is now the most popular way to get into Dublin, and it's already in need of expansion. I thought that maybe I should just ask Eva, when she grows up, what kind of transport would she like to take? And here's what she said. Grow up, I'm going, when I'm a vet, I'm going to go on a bus. You're going to go on a bus? Yeah. How come? Because there's loads of people and I get to make new friends. Is that better than taking a car? But my favorite thing about the buses is, um, thing I runs on poo. <laughs> okay, maybe I shouldn't have told her about the poo bus. That's going to come back to haunt me. But I thought it was interesting that Eva said that she'd prefer to take the bus to make friends because it reminded me of what Pope Francis recently said in his climate encyclical, which is that our transport needs to start respecting the mutual connections between people. Eva is instinctively drawn to the bus because she wants those connections. And she's not the only one. In America, car sales for 18 to 34 year olds has dropped 30% and the car manufacturers are stunned because the status symbol of the car has been replaced by the smartphone. And young people today, they don't want to sit in traffic. They want to be on buses and trains, hooked up to Wi-Fi and socializing with their friends. Now maybe if Eva could ride a bike, she would have chosen one of these because it's cheaper, faster, and it would keep her fit too. Our Dublin bike scheme has been a huge success. And it's actually an example of how the new sharing economy is making it possible for us to just own less stuff. We don't have to own and maintain a bike anymore. Ireland can keep learning from our neighbors to make cycling safer in Copenhagen. 45% of people cycle over any other form of transport. I was in the Netherlands uh, last month and I was shocked to see multi-story bike parking lots instead of car parking lots. Thousands of bikes parked in one place. Even here at home, we have a cycle path along the Grand Canal that was built three or four years ago that's at capacity. That path terminates at Google's European headquarters. 
which has 5,000 employees, but they only have 20 car parking spaces. And that's because they're connected to really good public transportation and this cycling lane. This lane, by the way, was uh, initiated by a group of three or 400 volunteers called the Dublin Cycling Campaign. And they managed to convince the National Transport Authority that this was worth the investment. Okay, so Eva's food, or sorry, her, her transport and her home look incredible to me. But the fact is that agriculture contributes one quarter of the world's greenhouse gases. And in Ireland in particular, agriculture contributes more than any other sector to our emissions. So in addition to an energy revolution, Eva's generation is going to need a food revolution. There are going to be 9 billion people on this earth in 2050. And we need a way to feed those people in a healthier, more efficient way without destroying the planet that they live on. Part of meeting that challenge starts with eating local seasonal food. Like the kind of food that's already being prepared at the Sage restaurant in Middleton County, Cork, where Kevin Ahern is preparing every meal from ingredients that are based within a 12 mile radius of his restaurant. Only 12 miles. Eva won't live in an economy dominated by fossil fuels. We've been doing that since the Industrial Revolution. But she's going to live in what's called a circular economy, where wealth is generated by using resources efficiently. For example, here in Ireland, we could power 150 buses just on the organic leftovers of Irish whiskey. It's great. In a circular economy, the waste from one industry becomes the food for the next industry. And what that means for Eva is that a whole new range of business opportunities and careers will be available to her. Right now, we know that fossil fuels and the burning of those fuels is implicated for a lot of respiratory diseases. Ireland has the fourth highest incidence of asthma in the world. And one third of our children, including a lot of Eva's friends, have asthma. So going fossil free, free means that we, imp that we reduce illness in our community and we get rid of one of the culprits of that kind of illness. Eva's community is also going to be more livable and less chaotic too. Some of you may cycle in Dublin and, and you know that we take our lives into our hands sometimes when we get on those bikes. But Eva's community will be designed better, so cycling and walking will be more enjoyable. People will start reconnecting with each other, and rather than fighting for a parking space, they'll be able to start shopping locally again. We know that our villages here and our high streets are failing because people have stopped shopping locally, and a fossil-free Ireland would help revitalize them. We import 90% of our fossil fuel into this country, so we are definitely not energy secure right now. And with all the global conflict going around us right now, we need energy security more than ever. Uh, the US Director of Central Intelligence just said that climate change is actually implicated in deepening the instability in places like Syria and Iraq. Because we're dependent on fossil fuels, we're actually further exacerbating that instability. For example, the Islamic State last year made $100 million off the sale of crude oil. I was shocked to find out that fossil fuels are funding terrorism right now. But a fossil-free Ireland can't be held hostage by a pipeline or an oil country. So when I think of Eva in 2050, I have to think of her in either one of two scenarios. I think of her in a world of climate change or a world of climate action. And when I think of her in a world of climate change, to be honest, I worry. I worry that she, she, her safety will be in jeopardy in an unstable climate. And I worry that she'll be at the mercy of foreign countries for energy and food. And they might be struggling with their own climate chaos and not be able to provide for her. But when I think of her in a world of climate action, in a fossil-free world, 
I feel relief. I feel relieved that, that she won't have to worry about energy or food, and I feel relieved that possibly she'll have a healthier and a better life than I have today. Right now, our government maintains the status quo. But just like we've outgrown our old construction methods, we've outgrown the Industrial Revolution. We don't need fossil fuels for our economy to thrive anymore. If we want that world and not this one, we have to positively disrupt the status quo. We have to insist that our government move away from business as usual and transition to a fossil-free society. I'm not going to deny that that change is really hard and really big. We're addicted to fossil fuels, and it's a tough road to break that addiction. But I've shown you that a fossil-free Ireland is a better Ireland than the one we live in today. And you know, solving climate change, it's actually not about sacrifice. It's, it's about doing things we'd want to do anyway. Just look at the communities I've shown you today. Clock Jordan Eco Village, the Aran Islands, all of them, the Dublin Cycling Campaign, they asked for a better way of doing something. You've all heard the adage, ask and you shall receive. And I know it sounds cliche, but in the case of a fossil-free Ireland, it's the ask that is the only thing that's missing. Not enough of us have asked to become fossil-free. Your life, like, like Eva's life, it, it has puzzle pieces, and all of those puzzle pieces can become fossil-free, but you have to start asking. All the technology is there. Even the students at this university last week asked to become fossil-free. I'd like to live in a fossil-free Ireland, and I'd really, really like Eva to live in a fossil-free Ireland. Now I hope you'd like to live in a fossil-free Ireland too. If you do, just ask for it. Thank you.